I wasn't going to stream today. And then I realized I have a really good reason why I should. I'd hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land, I'd hammer all danger, I'd hammer on a warning. If you follow me on Twitter, you may know that I have an art wall, and you may know that I have been, I, I, I do this thing where I take works that I enjoy but cannot afford to buy, and I paint them my own versions of them. And so, I have an art wall of, of things that I couldn't afford. I wanted on my wall, and so I painted them. I'm gonna turn out the thing. Take cam for a moment. And this is my art wall. Now, if you are a graphic designer, and you think that your work might contribute to my art wall, I don't have money to pay you for things. That's why I'm painting things that I can't afford. So don't try to sell me anything, please. It happens more often than you'd think it would where people are like buy something from me and i'm like i don't have money i'm student i broke and people are like but, but you can buy this and it'll make you money and it's like no it won't make me money because it will make you money get the shit out of me but anyway welcome to the stream don't ask about this shirt don't ask about this I think we're good. I think we're good. So we're gonna be playing uh, Bioshock today. I don't know. Who the fuck is my be right back screen? It already looks. Sounds better. It's still a lot quieter than me. Never mind. Look, Daddy, it's you. I'm very excited. I'm far more excited than I thought I'd be. Oh my god, I love the game. God. Oh, that's so fucked up. I know I'm gonna turn this into a video, and like this scene. I'm the one where they're kind of in the daydream. Oh God. Oh. Oh no. What is this one? Oh, I think that's the. I know what that one. This is not your daughter. Do you understand? Her name is Eleanor, and she is mine. Okay, man. Look, everything sucks. It's making me mad, and it seems like for these freaking things, whatever, we're gonna make the best out of what we have, and so you're just gonna have to listen to me making. Boop, 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 or something like that noises every time there's an introduction screen. I'm sorry that it's come to this, but I literally cannot. Boop, 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 or something like that noises 
Boop 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 or something like that noises. Boop 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 or something like that noises. This is the title screen. This is the title screen. Because I am talking at volumes that are very loud. If our one of those guys likes to copyright, well, you can't copyright this design. Made it. In fact, I copyright this, so you can use it in your video. I'm gonna catch Take three. I believe that a good magician never reveals their tricks. When you reveal the trick or pull back the curtain, suddenly the magic becomes mundane. Some people call it spoilers. Something is spoiled when you know the end of the story. I don't believe we can't enjoy spoiled things, but I do think there may be a point to this. I like to write my papers like novels, something which annoys many of my professors to no end. I hold things back. I play sleight of hand. I put the thesis at the end of the paper instead of the beginning. Because if you think about it like a fiction writer, everything is building up to that thesis. Everything written is supporting the thesis, fleshing it out, making it something we can pick up in our hands and carry around. It's only in academic writing where the thesis needs to be in the first paragraph or the abstract. And I get it. Somebody reading a scientific study doesn't want to read to the end. They want the relevant information so they don't waste time scanning through data that might not even be useful. But I don't write scientific studies. I write video essays. This is the final video in this series for now. And my last chance to prove to you that there is something here. Something that you should take with you. Something that will be valuable. Something, anything, something that you can comment on and like and subscribe to. <sighs> this is the point of no return, the big reveal. In this video, I will show you my master plan as I have Phantom of the Opera playing in the background. It's muted, so you can't hear it, but it's there. In my previous video, I told you about Bioshock. Insert Bioshock section here. Bioshock is one of my favorite game series. And a lot of mess has been made about the illusion of choice within the game and the morality of the choices within the game. And those discussions are kind of boring. Because Bioshock, like anything else, is a symbol. And so we as vibes-based scientists should try to understand the symbols, the stories. How the great impossible. is your undersea city if you haven't even develop the technology to have moving squid. City, where the artist would not be obsessed, where the scientist would not be bound by pity. Yeah, if you haven't even the developed the technology be to have, like, moving, moving pictures, okay? If you decide to take the hard route, but do the right thing and rescue as many as you can, forgive those who caused harm and push everyone forward, everyone you care for rises with you. So we hear Andrew Ryan engage in this rhetoric where he tries to make our nice socialist and anarchist and divine rightist. Uh, maybe not all of the things are nice. But he tries to take a few of our nice things and make them not so nice. He tries to turn them into symbols of individualism and use them to foment division in a city of people rapidly declining because they live in a house made out of glass under the sea and are all trying to shoot each other with machine guns and blow each other up in the city made out of glass under the sea. Wonderful. Oh yeah, and there's a lot of pheromones in the vent that do mind control to you too. That, that also happens. Anyway, it is this elevation of individualism, squabbling over power and resources that is the rot destroying the city. And our choices as the player character give us the ability to give in to this individualism. Or to reclaim the power of the collective. 
the choice to elevate our own needs over those of others, or to sacrifice potential resources to save lives. Thank you, mister. Thank you. The path of the righteous is not always easy. Yes. This is a game about killing drug-addled eugenicists with grenade launchers and machine guns and a city made of glass under the sea. But despite the horrific images, at the core of the story is an overwhelming message about the power of love, forgiveness, and found family. A story about rejecting the aesthetics of propaganda and giving according to your ability and to another's need. If you are one of those guys, if who likes to copyright, who likes to copyright, well, you can't copyright this design. In fact, I copyright this, so if you use it in your video, I'm gonna get it. So Andrew Ryan is building a city under the sea. And the city under the sea is rapidly devolving into an arms race. Um, because of, you know, fascism and eugenics and violence and everybody having a grenade launcher in a city made of glass under the sea. Why do we need fire hands again? Uh, I mean, I, I, fire hands can be fun when, like, everybody is smoking a cigarette, I guess. But then, like, we need that clip where I tried to light the cigar and everything blew up. Put that in there. Put that in there. That's a that's a good reason why we don't actually need fire hands. Go ahead. Go ahead. But this party just hit the skids. Carl needs a light for his cigar, and no one can help him. You're, you're lighting the cigar. That's not lighting the cigar. That's lighting his whole entire head on fire. Like, this is not... This plasmid is not about fun... This is plasmid is about, like going scorched earth on all of your enemies. Yeah, yeah, I get it. This isn't about gun control. Quit your yapping. To understand this, we're going to need to talk about video game design. And to talk about video game design, we will first need to review semiotics. In my previous video, threshold concept number four, I told you about semiotics. Semiotics are how we understand discourses and participation within a discourse is how we show that we share values, assumptions, and language, and sometimes emotes. And of course, we go to school to learn these things. Not just how to read and write to particular forms of literacies, but meta literacies. And all the values, assumptions, and language, typically not emotes, though, that are contained within. In threshold concept number three, I told you about ideology. Ideology is a guiding force that shapes the fabric of our lives. These things both come up out of our material conditions, but also reinforce the status quo that creates our material conditions. For example, we are living under a capitalist system, the majority of wealth is within the hands of the few, and the rhetoric of our society is that people who work hard make wealth, which is why many people believe that billionaires work 2,000 times harder than the average Starbucks barista. And in fact, that Starbucks barista is not actually working class, but some kind of middle man managerial class who is actually the one exploiting you by not serving your latte fast enough. Ideology, discourses, assumptions, values, language. Emotes? Emotes. This is why we call learning a social act. Learning is a social act because we do it together. Students work together to negotiate the new knowledge that the teacher is displaying to them, but students are also being assimilated into social cultural fabric as they are negotiating that knowledge. In the end, a student's literacy is far less dependent on the knowledge that they can display and much more on the way they perform that knowledge. This is why multiple choice standardized testing is not a reliable method of gauging a student's level of learning. We call this situated learning and it happens across many different contexts. And I'm going to pause here because situated learning is championed by many as the solution to the education problems of today. But as a theory, I think it's also useful to understand the problems with education today. We are always situated within ideology. We are always situated within culture. We are always situated within value systems. And it's important to reflect upon the vast discrepancy between what the educational system is touted to teach us and what the performance of our assimilation into that institution shows we've learned. In kindergarten, we sat at our desks and learned ABCs, but we didn't just 
learn ABCs. We learned that the best way to learn ABCs was with a teacher standing at the front of the room, the children sitting silently with hands folded at desks. We learned that the teacher is always right about which ABCs are in which order. We learned that we shouldn't shout our ABCs, but we also learned that if you whisper your ABCs, you aren't really learning. And so what you need to do to learn ABCs is face forward with your feet on the ground, eyes to the front of the class, with no distractions on your desk, and without playing with something in your desk, and recite the ABCs in an even tone. And just in learning our ABCs, we have learned a whole metric fuck ton of values, assumptions, and language about what learning is. So learning is situated, and we are always going to learn something, even if what we learn was not what we were meant to learn. The problem, the problem with the education system these days is there is a fundamental lack of preparation for the top of the hour ad break that is occurring right at this moment. <laughs> And <laughs> oh my God, bro, you you need I, you debated to... me. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking piece of shit! How dare you? What you can do is you can subscribe, and so you can avoid the ads that appear for a three minute duration at the top of every hour. I'm not gonna do the Foucault discipline and punish Panopticon stick here, but if you know what it is, then you've probably already written a comment about it. Good on you, I guess. For everyone else, uh, the, the, in the briefest way possible, discipline is not about being disciplined. It's about conforming to certain values, assumptions, and language through self-monitoring because we want to live in a society. This is part of why it's so hard to change society. We have assumptions, values, and language about how society works. And the whole system is designed to replicate those assumptions, values, and language rather than teach the ABCs or anything else. This is why STEM, nuff said. Now let's take this idea of situated learning and apply it to the video games. First, I want to establish a dialogic shift, which I will be taking for this section. Up until now, we have understood that discourses are sets of values, assumptions, and language, and sometimes emotes. In fact, I've said this so many times, it's probably becoming a meme. But for the rest of the section, at least this section, I will now be using the word literacy or literacies in place of values, assumptions, and language, and sometimes emotes. This is because the performance of values, assumptions, and language within a particular discourse is called a literacy. If you perform well, you are typically considered to have good or high literacy, and if you perform poorly, you are typically considered to have low or poor literacy. The most important thing to remember here is that literacy is not about reading, speaking, or writing words, but rather one's ability to perform within a discourse and replicate a genre. In What Do Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy, James Paul G. tells us that there are 36 ways to learn a video game. G's understanding of video games is based in semiotics and situated learning, and this book offers many ideas about why what we know about good video game design is good video game design. And at the crux of this is the idea of environmental storytelling, which you will be familiar with if you watch video essays about video games. Based on our previous discussion of situated learning, we can understand that any type of environment within a game will teach us something about the world of that game, because as we play the game, we are building a literacy of the world within our game. And this often is difficult because those literacies may be radically different from any which we have developed familiarity with. In H. Bomber Guy's Bloodborne is a Genius and Here's Why, we learn about the difficulty that many people have playing Souls games and how this difficulty comes from the specific game design elements and game mechanics that players are not accustomed to. Within the first five minutes of the video, H. Bomber Guy explains how a core mechanic of the game, the tiny amount of lag between pressing a button and character response, requires that players must relearn what they know about video games. This means that Souls games represent a new form of literacy which players will have to acquire in order to enjoy participating within the game. And I have not acquired this literacy yet. I'm going to go out of my way for once and talk about something positive. I'm going to talk about a game I really, really like. I'm going to talk about Bloodborne and why it's amazing. Okay.
Okay, to start off, we're gonna have to establish a baseline, aren't we? Bloodborne's amazing, but the Souls series has always been good. Let's start by talking in basic terms about the core gameplay. They are, when you boil it down, basically action games attempting to recreate the same sort of stuff RPGs like Dungeons & Dragons were designed to simulate, adventures in magical lands with dungeons and or dragons. They control in a vaguely similar way to other third-person action games like Devil May Cry or Drakengard or Dynasty Warriors or even The Legend of Zelda. However, despite superficial resemblance, in practice the games operate very differently from those. All the games I just mentioned here have a focus on instantaneousness, fluidity and flow or speed. You press the button and the character is immediately doing the thing. Dante is doing the stabby or the jumpy or the flippy as soon as you press the button commanding him to do it. He's such a good boy. I hit the relevant button based on when it was clearly telegraphing that I should be doing it, and then it happened instantly. The Souls games are theoretically similar, but choose such a different core design philosophy that I bet some of you winced when I compared them to character action games the way I just did. When you press the attack button in a Souls game, you've not just committed to an attack, you've committed to the long, arduous process of signing the proper paperwork to get planning permission to start to swing your sword. You don't immediately see dividends on the button you pressed, you have to wait for the attack to go off. On top of that, instead of attacking and moving being an infinite resource, you have a limited amount of stamina you can invest at any given time. So you can't rely on mashing the attack and dodge buttons to get by. And then, if you press the wrong button, you can't hit undo, you can't cancel out of an attack into the roll you should have done, you get stabbed instead. This creates an immediate friction between you and what you want to achieve. You can't just hit the button when you see an opening, or dance around and wait until one gets handed to you. You have to learn to prepare and observe the timing of your enemy, and be able to know when to act instead of simply acting, or use your limited stamina resource to create an opening by dodging an early attack. This is the main reason why the series has always been a little bit divisive. Its deliberateness puts it directly at odds with almost every other game of its type, which strive to make actions as quick as possible and give the player tons of control and freedom. So, Bioshock. In the first Bioshock game, you are Jack, and you are up against Andrew Ryan, and then some other guy. I don't remember his name. Just slipped my mind. In Bioshock 2, however, all of the antagonists of the first Bioshock game are long dead and gone. They are replaced by Dr. Sophia Lamb, a psychiatrist who wants to shove all of the brains of Rapture into her daughter Eleanor Lamb using the magic undersea slug juice that has driven everyone from Rapture completely and utterly bonkers, and this is supposed to turn Eleanor into the savior of Rapture who will rule Rapture with her high mind. And this seems like a collectivist wet dream, right? You know, because it's under the sea. Right? Like last time we were critiquing individualism, right? <laughs> so now it's time to, to, to both sides, right? Now it's time to, to take a jab at the, the dirty commies and do a red scare, right? 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 Uh-oh. If you are one of those guys who likes to copyright, well, you can't copyright this because I made it up. In fact, I copyright this, so if you use it in your video, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. Hold up. I'm supposed to be showing you how I performed the magic trick, uh, not introducing more mysteries that I will have to resolve. Fuck. We need to focus. Focus on how the meat is made. Focus. 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 Okay. Okay, the videos. We need we need to talk about the, the, the videos. Starting now. Each of my videos has been made to illustrate a concept. I call these threshold concepts after naming what we know threshold concepts of writing studies by Linda Adler Kastner and Elizabeth Wardle. Originally identified by researchers J.F. Meyer and Ray Land, Threshold concepts are ideas that learners must see through and see with in order to participate more fully in particular disciplines. Meyer and Land have identified characteristics that are associated with learners' encounters with threshold concepts, noting that they are list time, troublesome, 
These concepts may be conceptually difficult and butt up against prior knowledge that is inert, contradictory, rarely used, or unchallenged. They may also ask learners to take on new identities that are uncomfortable. Liminal, threshold concepts involve what the name implies, thresholds. But the movement towards and the hopeful crossing of those thresholds isn't straightforward. Instead, it happens in a two steps forward, one step backward kind of way as learners push against troublesome knowledge. Integrative and transformative. Once learners cross a threshold, their ability to see through and with a threshold concept leads them to recognize new patterns of meaning around that concept. The ability to see through and with that concept also transforms their understandings of phenomena, people, and or events. Probably irreversible. Once a learner begins to see through and with a threshold concept, it is very difficult to unlearn or unsee through that lens. Using this framework, I've attempted to create a set of concepts of my own, and I believe these concepts are important for building leftist community. Autocorrect says I should say communities here, but I'm not talking about communities as a thing, but rather community as an action, a process. In my literature review, I briefly talk about all the different communities that I've been a part of. Sims communities, blogging communities, reviewing communities, gaming communities. And in all of these communities, I found things that were necessary to me. But it wasn't until I found the Hasanabi community that I found community. And each of the reasons is in my videos. What do I always say? 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 What do I always say, dude? What do I always say? Bodies of the problem. In this video, I told you that we learn through doing. Doing is scary, but we aren't doing alone. There are people just like us out there who are afraid of doing whatever it is they need to learn. When we all work together to learn, to help each other learn, one person not knowing is far less scary. Say the line, chat. It's like a muscle. Making my peace. We all deserve to speak our piece, to say the things we need to say, even if we don't have the words yet. We must see things as they are rather than as we are told to by understanding how power works within our society. Rule number one, get nukes. Rule number two, never give up the nukes. Rule number three, if America or an imperial superpower tells you you have nukes, drop everything and find nukes. People gotta eat. We are hurt people and we are gonna hurt people. We have been taught not to value boundaries and consent, and our society holds different people to different standards, often unfairly. This is symptomatic of a capitalist profit mode of society, and we must engage with others in a constructive way that does not perpetuate cycles of harm. In our current capitalist economic system, the gains are privatized, but the losses are socialized. Sustainability. We need community because we are human. We need to share things because we are human. And sharing makes us stronger. Sharing responsibility, sharing codes, sharing memes, sharing knowledge. All of this sharing builds up. And eventually we will come to a place where we do not have to rely on our work alone or our capacity to persist in the space and do the work alone. Because we share the burden, it becomes lighter for all of us. Yes, the reason why what do I always say is probably the most said line in this channel is because I unfortunately have to repeat myself every single day. Being a Twitch streamer, especially a leftist political commentator living in the United States of America and consistently talking about issues that pertain to like American existence in contemporary society means that I have to repeat myself sometimes numerous times over the same hour, over the same broadcast, and certainly over the, uh, over the course of a year or multiple years. That's precisely why you can look back at videos that I have cut from like 2016, 2017, even before that, and look at the exact same arguments that I am using back then and, and have it apply perfectly, unfortunately, perfectly into our current existence. <laughs> this is fire. God damn, this is from three weeks ago. Holy shit, it's so good. Shouts out to shouts out the little bear. That was a incredible.
I was going to do a live stream recording for this part, but plans change. After seeing people with somewhat sketchy and contestable ideas of what Audrey Lord's The Master's Tools will never dismantle the Master's house, I wanted to make sure we are all on the same page, especially since this is the Threshold Concepts Master's Tools Master's House. It is a particular academic arrogance to assume any discussion of feminist theory without examining our many differences. And without a significant input from poor women, black women, and third world women and lesbians. And yet I stand here as a black lesbian feminist, having been invited to comment within the only panel at this conference where the input of black feminists and lesbians is represented. What this says about the vision of this conference is sad. In a country where racism, sexism, and homophobia are inseparable. To read this program is to assume that lesbian and black women have nothing to say about existentialism, the erotic women's culture and silence, developing feminist theory or heterosexuality and power. And what does it mean in personal and political terms when even the two black women who did present here were literally found at the last hour? What does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow perimeters of change are possible and allowable. A surface reading of this might lead us to the assumption that the issue Lord has is one of representation. There are not enough seats at the table for all the different identities within the world, and this issue could be fixed if we were just willing to hire more of X group of people. I will not say that representation is unimportant, but I can say without a doubt that representation does not fundamentally change the issues that lack of representation seem to be the cause of. This text requires a deeper level of engagement than representation matters. Lack of representation is a symptom of a greater issue. Advocating the mere tolerance of difference between women is the grossest reformism. It is a total denial of the creative function of difference in our lives. Difference must not be merely tolerated, but seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. Only then does the necessity for interdependency become unthreatening. Only within that interdependency of different strengths acknowledged and equal can the power to seek new ways of being in the world generate, as well as the courage and sustenance to act where there are no charters. With this quote, we see that the issue of representation stems from a fundamental rejection of interdependency, something Lord associates with patriarchy and individualism. Lord believes that feminism should advocate for a world which rejects the patriarchal and capitalistic mythos of the individual. The one great man who represents all great men in favor of interdependency. A world that rejects the very principle of the table, the, the table representing power, prestige, control, and domination. The table that determines which values, assumptions, and language, and eventually emotes, are the ones that are rewarded and which ones are rejected. Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to stand alone, unpopular, and sometimes reviled, and how to make common cause with those others identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. The master's house is not simply who wields power and authority. The women Lord mentions who define the master's house as their support are women who would be victim to patriarchal violence, just like any other. But in this situation, they are allowed to wield that power and authority of the master's house so long as they agree to use the master's tools.
we people of the meme understand this to be girl boss, gaslight, gatekeep. The master's tools will designate people to represent their group. Certain excellent people who are meant to represent every single person of that group they come from, and if they represent them poorly, a phrase which here means, in ways that do not conform to the master's values, this means that the master's door should never have been open to anyone of that group at all. The table, the conference, the board of executives, the halls of Congress, the presidency, the minimum wage distribution center or latte making job that you get fired from for attempting to unionize. We see the master's tools and the master's house reflected in all levels of society. We see the metaphorical table, a seat at which determines if we are valued by society or discarded. We feel despair because even as there is more representation of our different experiences, our different experiences are so similar in the way that we are all barely holding afloat as the boot slowly crushes our fingers, clinging to the life raft that might be our only survival. Lord understands that we are all engaging in a culture war when we should be engaging in a class war. I'm not a particularly religious person, but there is something undeniably powerful about the idea of nailing your 95 thesis to the church door. Luther's thesis was a rejection of the idea that your material wealth can determine your salvation. If you simply have enough cash on hand, you can ensure that you will reach heaven, while the rest of the masses will have to dick around in purgatory because fuck those guys, I guess. I don't have cash. Fuck. I'm an atheist. It's fine. It's fine. Luther was probably not the first class warrior, and I'm no theologist, so I can't attest to 
whether or not he was a very good one, but the image of this, the idea of speaking truth to power in a time when the church is the power, was kind of badass. Kind of badass, man. Rock on. And with that as my inspiration, I try to make every work that I create something that I could nail to a church door, whatever door is representative of the master's door. It's not easy, mostly because I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but also because I know I am within the system, the, the master's system. And I know that as a product of that, I have learned and internalized values and assumptions that I might not recognize I have. But I also know that within that system, my value to that system is entirely contingent upon whether I'm a traitor to the communities I belong to. Queer people, poor people, leftists, anarchists, and the communities I would conspire with. People of color, the people of Palestine, queer people whose identities are different from mine. I do not want my work to be used to perpetuate harm. I do not want my work to sit comfortably under the master's roof. Shit, I don't even want it to sit on his front lawn, man. I want it to be squatting outside of his house on the sidewalk next to an inflatable Scabby the Rat. I don't know, man. I feel like it could be kind of cool. You know? I want to smash the table into so many pieces that it can't be put back together again. We aren't there yet. We aren't ready. So instead, I need to learn. I need to learn and breed and grow and change as much as I can. And with each project I create, maybe I get a little closer. But I can't ever lose this framework, this way of understanding my work, what it needs to be doing, what it wants to be doing, what it's capable of doing, the system it exists within and how those systems impact it, sometimes without me even recognizing it. I call it process. We are all in process. Learning through doing, right? We can try. We can have a fun time. We can have hope. We can pass that hope on to other people. Because if I have fun and I have hope, even as I'm creating this disaster project, I... I can do the hard work of learning, refining my ideas, struggling with how I want to be perceived and how my work is perceived. If I can do that and still make it into a fun thing, a thing that isn't quite so scary, a thing that helps people along with their own journey of process, maybe that's what is really important about this project. As long as we engage in struggle, as long as we resist falling into despair, as long as we find the small joys in life and celebrate them together, I have faith that someday the trees I plant today will finally grow tall enough to give shade. I'm back on my Bioshock shit. Life is about transitions. Not, not transition title card slides. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, transitions in where we are, who we are, how we interact with the world, how we understand the world. Way back in part two of part two, I told you about Bioshock 2. Bioshock 2. <laughs> about the, the sea slug hive mind. The everyman, the man that has all of the seats for all the tables, and everyone is sitting at a seat in those tables. No, no, not Eleanor Lamb. Gilbert Alexander. Gilbert Alexander was a tool. <laughs> a scientist who worked for both Andrew Ryan and, um, some other guy. I don't, I don't remember his name. Um... But they were the two men who would be master of Rapture. Alexander was responsible for the creation of Big Daddies, the mindless, rage-filled dive suits you fight in Bioshock 1 and 2, because we don't talk about infinite. Big Daddies were once human, but were turned into monstrous creations through the magic sea slug juice that augmented their strength, abilities, and eventually even their minds. Alexander was responsible for the pair bond, which is the reason why the player character of Bioshock 2 is so desperate to reach Eleanor. If he doesn't, he will die. The other versions of this pair bond, the one we see displayed in most Big Daddies we meet within the game, 
make the big daddy territorial and possessive of the little sister he is meant to protect. In early versions of the pair bond, this was to an extent that the big daddy might die of despair if his little sister dies. Of course, this model of the pair bond was too destructive, so after this they focused on binding big daddies to the symbol of the little sister rather than to any individual. This reflects the broader Bioshock theme of family. Andrew Ryan's perfect city, free of ideological weight and able to do free market capitalism fairly and justly, has a tendency to warp and twist these family bonds. Ryan was killed by his own son, who was taken by some guy I don't know, and experimented on to create the perfect dog who would bark on command. Big daddies were warped into mindless monsters who fatherly love will lead them to either kill or die, while the, the parents, uh, the, the actual parents of the children are murdered or sell their children to science, or have their children just disappear and never be found again. And Sophia Lamb, our resident collectivist, wants to inject her child with so much of the magic juice that she will become a hive mind who knows all, sees all, and controls all. Of course, Sophia has reason to believe that this will not work because Alexander injected himself with the brain juice first. And it turned him into, uh... Uh... I mean... So far as I can tell, a giant, probably radioactive sea slug. An endem to that. So far as I can tell, a giant, probably radioactive sea slug who wants to murder you. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't dare. The artery. Very fun, very sexy, very normal, very cool. Right. Totally okay. Granted, he probably only wants to murder you because he lives in a kill-or-be-killed world where everyone has a grenade launcher in a city made of glass under the sea. Totally fine, totally normal, totally sexy, very cool. But who knows? The point is, Lamb knows what she's doing. She is a product of Andrew Ryan's rapture, even as she pretends that she is above it. And from within the protection of the master's house, she uses the master's tools to rule. Ryan may be dead. And some other guy whose name I forget. But the spirit of rapture lives on. And in the previous game, in this game, we are shown evidence of rapture's spirit. The crumbling edifice and infrastructure that was allowed to fail because the city's leaders preferred endless war and power struggles over maintaining complex architecture. The crumbling of which will eventually lead to the deaths of everyone when the whole thing eventually collapses because of the one physics word I know which is pressure equalization. Think a mass casualty event where everyone becomes fish food all at once. Yummy. The arms race where all the bad guys have guns, so all the good guys need better guns and fire hands. Boom. The instability of resources, the transactional nature with which human life is treated, the many, 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 many deaths of despair you see laid out in the bedrooms and hotel rooms of Rapture. A medical system designed around providing costly services to clients rather than giving care to patients. Does this sound familiar to you? Bioshock is like a feather tickling around the edges of your brain, calling to mind such images that feel familiar even though they are drastically different from how I experience the world outside the game. Literacies?
But even within this darkness, there is hope. Like Bioshock 1, the choice to save or kill the little sisters is up to you. But Bioshock 2 adds another layer of choice that will be important to the end of the game. You will encounter three people who play a great part in your journey and struggle. All of them are the reasons why you are in this state to begin with. Why you and Eleanor are suffering. And you can choose to kill them. Something any other citizen of Rapture wouldn't think twice about. Or you can choose to forgive them. And in the end, Eleanor, your little sister, will be free from Rapture and all its nightmares and horrors. And what will she take with her to the world above? What will she teach to the and little sisters she helped you rescue? The Rapture dream was over. You get to you choose that. that evil and then your away. character dies. Under the skin. I feel like but even have to spend, like, his spirit life. will live on Mercy within Eleanor. And, and that second, spirit will be passed down from her to all those she meets. And given the chance, you forgave. Yeah. Always. Mother believed this world was irredeemable. But she was wrong, father. We are Utopia. You and I. And in forgiving, we left the door open for her. The rapture dream is over, but in waking, I am reborn. This world is not ready for me, yet here I am. It would be so easy to misjudge them. You are my conscience, father, and I need you to guide me. with me now father your memories your drives and when i need you you'll be there on my shoulder whispering If Utopia is not a place, but a people, then we must choose carefully, for the world is about to change. And in our story, Rapture was just the beginning. Yeah, I really like this ending. <laughs> oh! <laughs> if you are one of those guys who likes to copyright, well, you'll have a really tough time of it, cause I made it up, I made it up, I made it up, I made it up. Oh, I, yes I did, I made it up, I made it up, I made it up, if you are one of those guys, you'll have a really tough time. I made it up. Bow, 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 bow. Yeah. Society prospers when old men plant seeds for trees they will never sit in the shade of. Sonnet 73. That time of year thou mayest in me behold. That time of year 
thou mayest to me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang in me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west which by and by black night doth take away death's second self that seals up all in rest in me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the deathbed whereon it must expire consumed with that which it was nourished by this thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must leave ere long I've actually written most of this on the Google Docs app on my phone because my desk chair hurts to sit on. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that there was something in it for you. It's my dream to find new ways of engaging students to build the abolitionist classroom. <laughs> the abolitionist classroom didn't make it into the final version of this project. I believe in learning through doing, throwing my body at the problem. And so this project, not just the videos, but the written portion, became this wild fantasy fever dream where I could stake out a place to imagine the world of the future, the student projects of the future, the scholarship of the future. But the abolitionist classroom is the classroom of the future. It's not a particular place. It can be anywhere at any time. There are no bells and desks and teachers standing in front of the room dictating to students about the assumptions, values, and language of the classroom. The abolitionist classroom is built around students' needs to be part of social groups, to, to face complex challenges that require complex solutions, and most importantly, to have fun. We need to have fun. Especially children. Children need to have fun, but also like adults, we all need to have fun. We need to have more fun. Shit sucks because we don't have enough fun. Jesus Christ. End of project. Not really, I, I still have a little bit more to go. Abolition doesn't start and end with prisons. Just like anything else, abolition is about the abolition of a system. As Angela Davis says in Are Prisons Obsolete? It's actually like the first fucking line. In most parts of the world, it is taken for granted that whoever is convicted of a serious crime will be sent to prison. First fucking page. The prison is seen as inevitable. The prison is seen as necessary. The master's tools are in the comment section ranting about bad guys. Stop doing that. Stop. Go away. And of course, the prison is in our schools and within our children in their restriction to certain places, their assignment to specific spaces and restriction from others. The top-down authority where they are largely powerless within the system and denied self-determination. Does this sound familiar to you? like a feather tickling around the edges of your brain. My first job was working in after school. It was a government program that was funded because it was meant to be academic. Think study hall for eight-year-olds after they've already spent the whole day sitting in school. And if you think that's not fucked up enough, this program was specifically designed for low-income students. Students whose parents couldn't afford to send them to the, the fun daycare, where they get to have fun. Because, you know, poor people need more discipline and all that jazz. There was so much potential in this program. But when we as workers with experience on the floor would struggle to make things better, we were often met with rejection by the administration that claimed to know what they were doing, but who were hopelessly incompetent when it came to actually dealing with children and their needs. It was this job that radicalized me. It was this job where I learned what it meant to build community. It was this job where I learned that even adults need to apologize when we fucked up. It was this job where I learned that most of our problems can be resolved by talking about how we feel about something that has happened. Most of our, most of, most of our problems. Most, most problems can be just, you can just talk it out. We don't need to wave guns and cameras around in each other's faces. Chill the fuck out, people. 
And it was at this job where I learned the strategies to move forward and heal, even if I couldn't see it at the time. And so in honor of these experiences and the kids I worked with who I still think about all the time, and my coworkers who were all working just as hard as me to make the best out of a shitty situation, I want to tell you about my threshold concepts one last time. For now, at least, maybe, I don't know. Bodies at problems. We learn the best through doing. So believe in yourself and, and keep trying. Failure is part of the process. Making my peace. We all need to learn emotional regulation and part of that is just talking about what bothers us. People gotta eat. Most people, but, but kids especially, don't have control over the things that will sustain them and are instead struggling to get what they need to survive. Have empathy and remember from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Sustainability. We all have something worthy of passing on to others. And one of the greatest joys in life is being part of a community that values you and what you have to share. Master's tools, master's house. We aren't going to change things by returning to tradition or creating stricter standards and higher expectations. Even if we believe that we need to prepare students who can thrive under capitalism, the way we are teaching now doesn't do that and that the system isn't designed to allow that. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, no matter how skillfully we think we can train our students to use them. We need to cultivate a student who is brave enough to speak truth to power, who is willing to resist injustice, who fights for equity. We need the students of a future that doesn't exist yet, because those are the students who can imagine that future. Those are the students who can kick ass to make it. Thank you for watching. This has been Proletariat Prince, and these are my five threshold concepts. I'll see you in the next one.